So hi, Josa, welcome back. Thank you, Adam. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. Also, I, w I, I was about to say welcome, but you're you're the host of this. Yeah, we can we can this switch program. this time. It uh, <laughs> doesn't one. matter. No, it's a symmetric show. <laughs> so uh, that's okay. Now the most important question: <laughs> you. What's your favorite coffee? Uh, currently, I have a mm -hmm. mocha. In what is mocha? One? Mocha is just what uh, is mocha? I, 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 it's a, it's a variety mm -hmm. of coffee. I think so. You know, you have it's like mm -hmm. wine. You yeah. have uh, grapes. You have so many different variety, and uh, for coffee, it's the same. And I am I am very fortunate to live uh, within walking distance of a mm -hmm. of a coffee coffee maker a shop dedicated to selling coffee. And uh, so I just say, hey, I like this one last time. So could you find e either the same or something cool. similar? And uh, the guy just said, oh, you should, you should try this one, and uh, that's fine. So I don't know much about coffee, but I, I know. I okay. Like this one. And, 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 and are the pictures the, from the coffee casts from yeah. from the coffee shop? Uh, actually, not. This uh, this background is uh, is a picture I found on the on the internet. It's a license free picture published maybe on okay. Splash or something like that, and it was taken in a coffee shop in New York by a photographer named mm -hmm. Andy Falconer. Uh, so credits to him for this picture. And it's uh, I, I could locate the coffee shop very precisely. It's near mm -hmm. the Cathedral of York, and uh, yeah, that's it. And I just like the, I mean, yeah, the yeah. mood of this picture. You know, the coffee, the the the, the, the small pastries. Yeah. The small and to pastries, the listeners, to make the, to make the listeners curious, uh, they have to watch your YouTube uh, newscasts. Is named properly, not coffee casts, and they will find the background image, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> This is the background image I use for uh, for the for the Jeb Cafe. I called I called the series the I yeah, the and series I renamed it the last time to yeah. Coffee Cast because <clears throat> it's so nice. But um, okay, so uh, regarding coffee, because yeah. I also like coffee, and uh, the the uh, I know there is Americano, there is a Mocha, and uh, it is sometimes hard to tell, you know, the mixture and doing what it is. So this was the the, the mm -hmm. question. But um, do you know uh, coffee press or Aeropress? Oh, the, the the thing mm -hmm. that you with the kind yeah. of level like yeah yes I, I I used to use that when I was a student because it's very cheap stuff you, usually when I was a student yeah it was very uh, cheap the, the Aeropress so is this, still this twenty is euros but this is from plastic and this is not the French press mm -hmm. it is like oh. uh, it is from uh, it is uh, it is called Aeropress from the company called Aerobi uh, and this is the best coffee you can get okay. so it looks like your coffee right now and. Uh, And uh, then, of course, mm -hmm. you can have a drip coffee. I don't know how to call it. It's just with machine. Also nice. And then, you know, the proper Italian machine coffee, like espresso. But it tastes differently. So this is why I wanted yeah. to have a little chat with you, because I also like a coffee a lot. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But back to, or back, let's start with Java 21. So the next uh, most important question, or, mm -hmm. or, or a little bit, Less important question, but what's your favorite Java 21 feature? Um, that, that's quite a tough question, I would say. Personally, the the, the my favorite feature mm -hmm. are virtual threads, because this is really, for me, this is really the first step of uh, so many new opportunities that are going to develop in the future uh, in, in the field of reactive programming and uh, how to increase the throughput of your application when you're doing... Uh, services or or, or or clients, by the way, anything blocking. So most of the time, uh, network request, any kind of network request you will uh, you will have to do in your application uh, will benefit from using uh, versus threads. And it's, uh, it's something that will, what I see as of now is that it's something that, that will allow you to greatly simplify the way you write your code. Uh, and and the, the consequence of that is that it will make it so much uh, it, it, it will be so much easier to maintaining in the long run this kind of uh, ugly I, I call it ugly because it's not because it's ugly it's because it's super hard to write and super hard to read uh, reactive code and uh, using virtual thread will allow you to, to get rid of all this programming model that is callback based call, lambda based function based um, A programming model, uh, and I think it will uh, it will be a great things in, in the future. Not now because so far we just have virtual threads and we did, we need more things around them to um, to to completely leverage them actually. 
but uh, th that's the, really the starting point. So yes, for me that's the yeah. most exciting uh, feature. Uh, maybe even the most <coughs> hidden feature because usually the virtual threads are going to be used by Helidon behind the scenes, for instance, uh, hopefully. But um, but yeah. I'm glad you said ugly because this was my opinion for years. I happily ignored reactive programming. <laughs> I, I think I always rejected to write the code. Right. I got lots of contracts from my clients to help them with debugging, you know, reactive uh, programming applications or how to call it, applications written in a reactive way. And uh, sometimes, you know, they called me and say, mm -hmm. you know, how to debug this? It's like, no idea what you did, right? So, and why you did it? And what I never understood, why reactive programming was hyped as something nice or interesting. For me, it would be, you know, ugly, but necessary sometimes, but not like, you know, nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was in the lucky situation that I never worked for Netflix or YouTube or something like that. So what I did, I ignored the entire, uh, you know, reactive programming efficiency gains. So I shipped, you know, usually Payara, Glassfish, Whitefly, whatever, use at most the suspended in JaxRS, <clears throat> which was sometimes good enough. And uh, and this is perfect because uh, all my, all code I've written is perfectly simple. And now, if we get you know virtual threads, I hope that the platform gets updated and there is nothing to do. This is the perfect case for clients, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. and this makes me excited absolutely. because the... what um, yeah. <clears throat> you know a few years back, if you no, know, in every conference they selling you know the hottest stuff like reactive programming, and you are more more or less alone and try to write simple code. You always, I always thought, you know, am I just, you know, I don't understand it or what's wrong? But uh, in Java, sometimes a good strategy to write simple code and wait. And the platform engineers, you know, from <laughs> uh, from from Java, they fix it behind the scenes. It happens. It happens a lot. I remember, you know, the entire pulling uh, uh, tricks with objects at the beginning, write your object pool or whatever. Now, in one point of time, yeah. it was worse if you had your pool. Because uh, the hotspot was actually better, you know, to managing the memory than your pool, which introduced memory leaks usually. Or I don't know whether you remember, you know, the string concatenations that you have to use String Builder. In one point of time, you know, the uh, Java compiler did it and you could write, you know, simple code and it was resolved behind the scenes. I would say you are maybe right. So virtual threads mm -hmm. are, uh, are um, the most important feature. I wouldn't say this is my most favorite feature, but I think the most important one because um, it will make Java viable to write highly concurrent code uh, or highly, yeah, highly concurrent code in a simple way, right? That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, concurrent and blocking, because virtual set are not for just for concurrency. I mean, if you, if you take a parallel stream that is doing some in-memory computations, uh, whatever the, these computations are, and you you just uh, move uh, this parallel stream on virtual threads, odds are that you will actually degrade your performances. Because if you don't block a virtual thread, then mm -hmm. you're not gaining anything. Uh, a virtual thread is, is running uh, on top of a platform thread. Okay, so running a task in a virtual thread is actually an overhead compared to running it in a regular platform thread. So if this task is not doing anything outside of your 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 application memory, then this overhead, there's no gain to balance this overhead. Now if this task is doing some network request, so some blocking code. But by blocking, I mean code that will just continue to use your platform thread, but not using your CPU for like milliseconds, which is usually the case when you're doing REST request or any kind of internet request. By the way. <clears throat> not only rest. Uh, if you're not blocking your, your plan, then there is no no gain to be to be uh, to be accept, uh, expected from uh, from uh, from virtual threads. So virtual threads are really for for very precise use case. This is this is there, there are so many people writing many things and recording many things for YouTube about virtual threads, and, and most of them, I would say, most of what I what I saw actually, uh, at least. Uh, completely misses this point. Virtual threads are really for your yeah. blocking code. For efficiently for waiting, right? If you, if for efficiently regular... waiting for stuff to happen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. If you, I mean, the, the so, so far the garbage collector, which is pure in-memory stuff, is not running on, in mm -hmm. a virtual thread because it's... It, it You're also a bit that. big enterprise, yes. as I remember the last conversation. And uh, I don't know whether you remember Grizzly. It is like, you know, the uh, small piece of Glassfish. 
And yeah. it was a, a long time ago. And I had also mm -hmm. a podcast with the creator of Grizzly. And um, and uh, they started with it because back then we needed to know the long polling, so-called Comet. So what Grizzly was able to do, mm -hmm. it was able to block forever and it parked the threat, right? So, and what we could do is we can wait until the browser mm -hmm. does something or uh, something, no, sorry, until on the server something happens and pushes, you know, the message back to the browser. So this was, this was like 10 years ago, I think. And we could do with it crazy stuff. So I remember in an insurance company, we communicated with the hosts. We have like millions um, of, um, not millions, 10,000s of connections, waiting connections, right? Something to happens. The mm -hmm. host pushed, you know, the the uh, the, the so backend host. It was ZOS, actually. This was the terminal integration. This was crazy. So if they selected something in the terminal in the host, it pushed to Glassfish and Glassfish pushed to the web client. So there was like, you know, um, a, a, a loop. And uh, this works surprisingly well, but you yeah. need to you know a specific runtime. So right now you could uh, do something with virtual threads or end another pattern, backend for frontend. So uh, it was uh, another project. So the, they use uh, the application server as a facade to a many microservices. And there was some coordination work going on. And this I saw, so, okay, this is the unique use case for reactive programming because the, you know, the, the router has nothing to do with it was Glassfish, then routing and waiting, right? And, and if we generate uh, generate a load, we could actually kill the server back then because you know every thread had some memory. And this would be also a perfect case for, for reactive prog programming back then. And now nothing to do. We could just use you no know, HTTP 11 Java client and just call you know the backends and just start every request with a new virtual thread and 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 task is done, right? But you are not that excited. Yeah. I'm really excited, you, and you, you, you are now, to, you know, to... you are now like you're very, you know, uh, how to to the point, and <laughs> and uh, and no more excited. So I'm really excited no, about that. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm very excited. No, no, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm very excited, and and I see that people are also yeah. very excited with this feature too. Because when I go to Jugs or talk to people, the first question that comes up about Java Java 21 yeah. is, yeah. is about virtual sets. I mean, this this is the topic people want to hear about, and and I'm I'm really happy with that because uh, first there was a lot of engineering effort be behind that. The, the work on virtual threads started started maybe six or seven years ago, <clears throat> literally. I remember the first, I probably remember that also, but the first uh, talks at uh, Devox Belgium, for instance, by uh, by uh, Alan Bateman. Well, like he was not talking about the virtual thread, but um, about yeah. fibers and continuations and this kind of stuff. But th this was really the the, the, the start of mm -hmm. this uh, engineering work uh, under the umbrella of the Loom project, because that, that's the name of the project. And it, and it took it took years to to set it up, and now it's working amazingly well. I mean, uh, it's really it's really crazy to. See I said Genau, which really, is exactly uh, in German. Virtual thread is really just just a simple. I said uh, yeah, genau, sorry? which is uh, by accident, <laughs> which is exactly in German. So, um, so, but um, uh, okay. yeah. in a client project, uh, I uh, we actually um, it, it looked like a virtual threads would be a good fit, but I explained them actually what happened behind the scenes. So I said, okay, the virtual thread is one point, but there is the issue now of of pinning, and what the JDK engineers did. Mm -hmm. They replaced, for instance, I think uh, URL, DNS, URL connection, and Zockets was replaced to make it non-blocking. So there was a huge effort. And they were delighted to yeah. say they didn't even knew that such innovation happens behind the scenes. You know, I, I told them, you know, whatever virtual thread, mm -hmm. thread touches, it has to be async. Other one, it gets pinned, you know, in the entire advantage. I hope this pinned, right, is the right term. It gets pinned to the carrier thread, and if yeah, it's pinned pin, to the pin carrier thread, the then before, the entire yeah. advantage is gone because then you have one-to-one -one <clears throat> relation. But I say, look, the entire JDK was replaced, and my feeling is Java 21 and later becomes to be the perfect storm. So it's like all small pieces and jabs mm. are are fitting together, so you can do, you know, uh, we are more than you know the 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 sum of all these small parts right now. This is this is what 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 makes me excited actually. It's funny because there are there are several places. Uh, if you check the JEPs prior to twenty one, there is one telling you the the method class from uh, the reflection API has been refactored uh, to now use method handles instead of what it was using before, and that that was actually the, it, the JEP doesn't say it, but actually the invoke method of the method class. So you, when you say 
method.invoke, which is a way of uh, invoking a method using the reflection API, uh, was actually calling some native code. So there was a possibility for pinning because when you invoke native code in a virtual thread, then this virtual thread will be pinned to your carrier thread, which is not such a big deal, by the way. Uh, and, and so re refactoring this piece of code with method handle now removes this, this uh, well, I would say opportunity, but th that would be a bad opportunity uh, of pinning uh, your 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 the code that is running in your virtual thread on the on, on the platform thread. It's only bad. Pinning is only bad if you are pinning uh, during uh, basically a network request. If you're if you're just doing some in-memory computation in your task and you're invoking, for instance, some, some native code, then during that time your virtual thread is pinned on your platform thread. But if you're not blocking anything, you're just pinning it for a few maybe hundreds of nanoseconds. And you you won't even mm -hmm. see it in your application. It's really bad if you're if you're pinning it, and while it's pinned, then you're blocking. You you, you invoke some some network resource or whatever, and then the pinning will last for mm -hmm. like a millisecond. So that that's bad because this platform thread mm -hmm. will indeed be blocked. And all the point of virtual thread is to avoid the blocking of your you know of your carrier thread that is a platform thread. And so in that case. You will probably need to do something. The, the, there are two main um, uh, ways to, to pin a virtual thread uh, on a carrier thread. The first one is to invoke native code, and probably you can't do much about that because, yeah, if you need to invoke your native code, well, you just need that, so that's it. And the second one is the the synchronized block, uh, which is which is a, a well known issue also. A synchronized block. There are there's work currently being done about that. So in the future, this this issue uh, will probably be fixed. Um, so no more problem <laughs> with synchronized blocks. <laughs> and if you if it's really an issue, and if you really experience um, performance hits with your synchronized block while moving to virtual threads, then you can refactor them to use reentrant logs. Uh, which this is was exactly this was my same. question. Uh, so if using the reentrant uh, re uh, uh, yeah. uh, logs, like for instance semaphores or whatever is in these uh, Java util logs package, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it uh, are they using mm -hmm. synchronized behind the scenes? No, there is no issue then, right? No. Okay, perfect. No, no. If you if you you if you just you just take a synchronized block, mm -hmm. you you identify the object that is carrying the monitor mm -hmm. that your synchronized block is uh, is using mm -hmm. because this object may be a, some kind of default object. So you just identify that. You, you take the same object and you 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 bind it to a, to a lock object to reentrant lock object and you refactor that with a reentrant lock. And it will work the same, and you won't have this spinning uh, issue anymore. Mm -hmm. But you you shouldn't be you shouldn't run. If, I mean, if you if you are in this situation, the first thing you need to do is assess the situation. Are you experiencing performance issues when you're moving your application to uh, virtual threads, and, and uh, are these performance issues coming from synchronized blocks? Because Odds are that it won't be the case. Yeah, but uh, the problem is most of companies are not that reasonable, right? So in my projects, what happens is they say, uh, we have to build highly scalable application and they already assume we need reactive programming, right? So this is what happens. And then I okay. ask the second question or the first question. My question is, uh, how many transactions per second do you have? And the answer is, we don't know. So, okay, then... Uh, so the answer uh, well, is probably 10. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is in most cases. So I think recently the most were 200 transactions per second which is basically nothing right so and if you have uh, 10 it doesn't matter and it's sometimes really 10 no kidding so but now i have the answer we say we do nothing and in case you really have to scale like crazy then we use virtual threads somehow right and the problem solved so what 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 it means is this virtual threads is a is a is a, is a good life hack you know to get rid of all fancy framework and just use you know the standard java so this is important to me because later we have the possibility to, on demand, increase you know the concurrency or whatever if we have network calls or whatever because we have virtual threads and and the problem solved. And later maybe never will never happen and we forget about the case. But I don't have to remove our framework afterwards, right? So this is this is the the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and maybe if you if you running on the on top of a well known framework like Spring Boot, for instance. Well, Spring Boot, you can you can you can have it run on virtual threads you know, with Java twenty one. Yeah, and they've been working on that. And uh, Spring Boot, I, I, uh, th there's a version of Spring Boot running on virtual threads. It, I think it started something like 
14 months ago, something, with the preview features mm -hmm. of AutoSeds in late 2022. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's super solid and you can just give it a try. There's nothing to do on your, on your part. Yeah. There's nothing to do. It's just, just a matter of configuring your Spring Boot engine to use Virtual Thread, and that's it. And I'm not even sure. It's, it's even possible that they're using Virtual Thread by default, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm it, not a Spring Boot expert. No, uh, I'm 95% no so. of my projects are Quarkus. And a similar story, mm -hmm. so you can activate the virtual threads, but you don't have to. So there is one, uh, so you, mm -hmm. this is your choice. But what happens on Quarkus, they also have a reactive programming framework. And this is what they try to go with, because they find a tutorial, mm -hmm. copy their code over, and just, you know, it's like, don't use it, just use your standard microprofile and 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 whatever, uh, JaxRS, basically. And Helidon is even uh, more interesting, because uh, in Helidon, yeah. they already uh, migrated everything to virtual threads. They are working closely with uh, the Oracle department and there is the, um, I forgot the name, not Mina, because Mina was something different, but they have... Nima. Hmm? Nima. Nima, exactly. Nima. Because Min That's Mina was, four, I think, another yeah. Apache project. It was Numa, exactly. Nima or Numa. And um, and uh, this is um, excites me more because they, they refactored everything from ground up. You know, this is like yeah. virtual thread first. Uh, or native. It's actually a virtual mm. thread native framework. Quark was a little bit. They did it afterwards, but they always experimented with it. And um, and um, yeah, this is where I spend my time. I have less, you know, experience with Spring Boot and more with Quarkus mm. because all my clients are using the micro profile or st stuff similar, Jakarta E or whatever. And and uh, Spring Boot doesn't support this very well. So that, that's the problem I have. Okay. 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 So... Um, Structured concurrency is the next one, right? It's not done yet, but yeah. But uh, structured uh, concurrency is the possibility to basically <clears throat> wait until all virtual threads are done, or some. This is the basic. There, there, there are several right? ways to uh, to consider structured concurrency. So, so first, uh, there are three features in in the Loom project: virtual threads. Mm -hmm. So we have it as a final feature in twenty one. Mm -hmm. So it's not a preview feature anymore. Structured concurrency and scope values are the two others. So far, there may be some more in the future, but these are the two we are waiting for as at the moment. Mm -hmm. And in 22, uh, to be released in March uh, 2024, so in like two months, um, uh, in 22, structured concurrency and scope values are still going to be uh, preview features. So it's not completely done yet, but we have been adding it as a, as a incubator and preview feature for more than a year now. So we have... A pretty good idea for what is coming uh, on, on this topic. And actually, structured concurrency, uh, it's not a new idea. It has been around for years, and it fixes a very old problem <laughs> with concurrent programming, like a problem we had since the very first versions of Java. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you that story because I, I, I think it's a very funny story. Uh, well, at least for people in development. Uh, you, you know, you, you maybe, I guess you remember the, the good old days of the basic language, mm -hmm. Adam, you know, where you had to write go to and, and jump to I I, I used GoSub because I was more sophisticated. Yeah. GoTo was, you know, it was an anti-pattern. GoSub, anti was, GoSub was, you know, the design pattern. <clears throat> GoSub was nice, but you also had this go to. Yes. Uh, and everybody knows that go to is bad. Yeah. All right. But now you need to ask the question, people, why is go to bad? And Oh, it's bad because because everybody say so. Okay, good. <laughs> they must have a root reason for that. And go to is bad because when you look at a line of your code, a piece of your code, if you have go tos in your language, then you cannot do any kind of debugging whatsoever. If it crashes on this line, understanding uh, what was the previous stuff executed by your program is very hard because you have go tos and, and you can go from anywhere to anywhere in your code. So you cannot cannot tell where was my program before when, when it crashes on that line. And that makes it very hard to, to, to understand your code, very hard to debug, almost actually almost impossible. So go to were removed, and it's good because now when you look at the line of code and it crashes there, you know exactly where your program was in a, in a previous step. It's either a method By the way, do you know, know that Java still supports method. go to? Yes, absolutely. But different. The, the, the go to is a reserved keyword in, uh, yeah, in Java. But yeah. Uh, it's a, so they can go to label, but sure. no more, right? You cannot go. You cannot. You, yeah. you can go you to can, a label, uh, I think, right? And no, you can't. You can break to a label. Or you can continue yeah, exactly. to a label, but uh, you cannot. Can, cannot go to now. Okay, so go to. We got rid of go to. So 
supposedly, when you look at the line of code in your in your, in your Java program, you know exactly where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Okay, and plus you have the stack trace, so no problem with that. There's one exception to that, which is when you launch a thread. Okay, and that's that the the root problem of reactive programming, by the way. Yeah. Uh, if you if you pass a lambda to a react some reactive code and there is a crash in this lambda, the stack trace does not take you to your program. It takes you to your framework, okay? Because this lambda was called for you on your behalf by some piece of your Quarkus, Spring Boot, whatever uh, reactive framework you're using. Okay, and when you create a runnable and you pass it to a thread and your runnable crashes, it doesn't take you to the place where you created your runnable or to the place where you started this thread. So actually doing that is just like doing go-to. You don't know where you're coming from. And that, that's a real issue. And that's, you, you were talking about how hard it is to debug reactive programming, but that's exactly why it is hard to debug it. It's hard to debug it because the stack trace doesn't give you any information about where you were when you actually created this, you know, uh, apparatus, well, stuff, uh, function that are calling each other uh, reactively. Where did you create this this piece of of of, of, of code? We, it's not in your stack trace. You don't know where you are. So that that's that's the issue. Structured concurrency aims to fix that. Structured concurrency is about launching tasks in virtual threads. It could be in platform threads, okay. But while keeping track of where you were when you actually launched this task. Okay, so you are not launching your task asynchronously, that, well, I, would, I should say uh, in, another, in another thread, and losing the place where you were when you did that. And, and that, that's, <laughs> it doesn't look like it, but when you, when you begin to write structured concurrency code, that's, that's a real revolution, actually. So if you have a crash in a virtual thread in, in your task, you know exactly where you are in your application and you know exactly where you were when this task was created and launched in this virtual thread. So this is actually exciting because I was really excited about the possibility of stru structure concurrency, like to gather, you know, all async processes and do something later. So as for me, it was like, yeah, structure the concurrency. But what you're saying right yeah. now is even more exciting. So it means uh, it also helps with Debug debuggability and observability, so you can see you know what happened. And this yeah. is the next challenge to all IDE vendors, right? So they <laughs> they have to display it yeah. right now correctly, right? Oh yes, but I mean, yeah, yeah okay. this is the that's job, right? Tool. So, this so is... new 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 tool, new support. Yes, uh, sure. IDEs. Yes, mm -hmm. that, that's just that, that's just expected. So basically, you create this object, which is a, an instance of a structured task group. You can see this object as a as a pool of thread. Mm -hmm. Uh, as an executor service. It works kind of the same as the executor service. The only difference is that it does not create any thread beforehand. It does not pull any thread. So you submit tasks, you get a future, which is not really a future uh, now anymore. It's uh, something else, but it looks like a future. And this, the, the responsibility of this object is just to take your task, create a virtual thread, run it in a virtual thread, and give you a future. Uh, in return immediately, mm -hmm. so kind of the same as the executive service. So it likes, the name uh, is structured, also, structured, structured task is the name of the new structured API. task scope. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a scope object. Mm -hmm. I like to call it scope object because mm -hmm. it's simpler. But uh, mm -hmm. the class is a structured task scope. So you submit your task. You can have as many as you want, and then at some point you can uh, join this object. So you call join on it, and join will uh, return. Uh, <clears throat> when all the tasks are done. Now, they could be failing, that is producing an exception. Uh, in that case, you can get this exception or produce a result, which could even be void, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but when join is called and it and it returns, then you know that all the tasks you submitted yeah. uh, are not running anymore. And this and, is good and, because uh, it's uh, the, the, synchronous for, for us Java developers. So it, behind the scenes, it's asynchronous, yeah. but John will wait, So which makes our world simpler, right? So our yeah, exactly. World. But mm -hmm. so this, this join is a blocking code, but if you're running in a virtual thread, it's okay because blocking a virtual thread is cheap. Yeah, even, you, even if it actually, blocks, it already blocks, okay. but all other threads are running in parallel. So let's say you have a task yeah. which you take, you know, uh, 50 seconds, but if you have five threads, you can able to split the task, you will block for 10 seconds, not 50. So uh, you are blocking, but everything runs yeah. in parallel. So you have to gain, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, your, the, 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 the hypothesis behind the scene is that you're blocking for like 
several milliseconds. The network request typically is between 10 milliseconds if you're on a fast network or 100 milliseconds if you're on a regular network. Could be more. So, and, and the, the, the processing time consumed by your task uh, is in the order of the nanoseconds. So basically you're not using your CPU much. So you can have many, many of these uh, tasks running mm -hmm. in parallel. So um, this is structured concurrency, so, right? So this is the, so, yeah. so that you have, uh, and so, but behind the scenes, I think it's not that easy. You, you have to be more tightly integrated with JVM. It's not like pure bytecode, right? So this is a tight integration, the structured uh, uh, tasks yeah, code so with the, the JVM. The, the, It, it works in a different way than uh, executor services. A mm -hmm. structured task scope is also an auto-closable object, mm -hmm. so you should use it in a try with resource mm -hmm. uh, statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you 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 prepare your your request, suppose you are I don't know querying hundreds of servers, so you launch your hundred tasks within this structured task scope. You call join, you get all your results, exceptions, and results, and you do whatever you have to do with them. And then, because you are in a try with resource statement, you produce a result, exit the try uh, the try block, and then this structured concurrency object uh, will be automatically closed for you, and everything is cleaned up. If you have like loose threads, for instance, threads you are still running, and uh, well, they will be interrupted and, and closed and garbaged uh, automatically for you. Mm -hmm. uh, if some of your tasks are themselves creating more virtual threads, which could be possible, okay? Uh, that is more structured task scope because everything should happen in this kind of object. Then closing the root structured task scope will automatically close all the children task scope that you that you created in your virtual thread. Mm -hmm. This is why it's called structured concurrency. A root scope object knows all the children and the grandchildren and the grand-grandchildren and so on. So if you close one at some point, it will automatically close all the others mm -hmm. um, underneath. Mm -hmm. So when you're done, you don't have any loose thread, which is, by the way, fixing another issue. <laughs> thread <laughs> groups? Programming, because loose threads <laughs> happen, you know? <laughs> you know that. <laughs> um, I ask you about, you know, the uh, structured task scope functionality and uh, tight integration with mm -hmm. JVM, because uh, one question... As an, as a one frequent question for my clients is, um, so let's go, we use Groovy, Scala, Kotlin, or language of the day, right? And my answer is, yeah. um, we have to be a little bit careful because if Java innovates in that space, sometimes if the languages, the, how to call it, other JVM languages, uh, um, try to replicate the feature, then maybe it's no more compatible. But uh, And if they don't replicate the feature, the question is, can they use the feature, right? So uh, there's always, um, so if you used to you know a few years ago Scala for concurrency, maybe now it's that there is not pointless, but less appealing, you know, to still use Scala to have a you no know, concurrent execution because uh, structured task scope just works out of the box with Java and uh, and and you don't have, you know, to, to, to use uh, Scala proprietary features to achieve the same, right? And even worse, yeah. if Java replicated that, uh, sorry, Scala replicated that in bytecode, maybe it's even impossible to have the same efficiency which Java has with tighter JVM the, integration, right? Um, I, I don't know if there is a, a good a good answer to this kind of question because, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Scala team and the Groovy team and the, the Closure team and the, and the Kotlin team are fully aware of virtual threads sure. and what the JVM is doing underneath and this kind of stuff. Uh, they've been following what has been done in, in the past few years very closely, I'm, I'm sure of that. And, and so they they probably propose some kind of solution to leverage that in their own language. Yeah, sure, Now, they, they, they will. were. They were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe they already. It's already done, and it will be published in the next. Few I, I'm sure it minutes. will. But but, but if, it, if you consider Scala, I think the first you know attempt. I don't know Scala was since 2006, seven or eight. Uh, I, I had the first conversation and tried to look and, and use it and. And uh, they had back then already, you know, amazing uh, concurrency. And this was way before Java introduced that, right? So this is interesting. If you mm -hmm. have your own, uh, how to call it, your own ideology or your own, you know, a semantic world, and then uh, and then you have to fit it into afterwards into into Java concurrency model. So this is the, the interesting part, which is always exciting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sure. You, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is you say you're sure because you know um, I have you know, to deal with the questions uh, 
uh, weekly, not daily, weekly, maybe once a week, um, and <laughs> and, uh, and uh, try to find you know uh, somehow objective objective answers. What's also exciting, because uh, what I like is consequent architectures at first, zero one, and uh, right mm-hmm. now we get it with uh, with Project Loom or or, or, or or virtual threads as well, because um, the majority right now of my projects are serverless. So it means I have AWS Lambda or Azure functions, and um, and this means we Project Loom is absolutely pointless. So because uh, our, our, my Lambda runs on a thread and it uh, starts and dies, and it, it makes no sense to start in the Lambda millions of threads because it, it works for one second, it, it is pointless. But um, it is an economic decision. We do it because it's cheaper. But what I already mm-hmm. see sometimes, maybe, we get soon a use case where it we get a uh, higher load, it is no more economical to, to, to run serverless, you know, because we get... Uh, several thousand transactions per second. So in this particular case, Mm -hmm. we have to switch back from serverless to server full. And uh, so likely we have Corcus, so the code is exactly the same. There's no difference. But what we could do right now, we can actually provision a bare metal machine, a bigger one, and run virtual threads on it, you know? So we have now uh, the same code. We can run in serverless mode um, for uh, for serverless mode uh, to save money for less active clients. And uh, and bare metal machine, you know, to to save money for highly active ad clients, and and this my, this is this is genius because because you have exactly the same Java code which can run, you know, in serverless mode or in server full mode with virtual threads, which is really it is it is great because from the maintainability perspective, you have exactly the same code base, and you can decide per client base or per, per tenant. Uh, basis uh, basis um where you would like to run the code right so and, and this is this is really nice because if you would start for instance with reactive programming then the code would be optimized for bare metal but on lambda it doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense to have reactive programming in lambda i mean you could do this but uh, it is just a waste no, of of resources right yeah absolutely so yeah. to say what you were saying me that the same programming model can adapt to to several Runtime environment. Not not so even programming great. model. We can we can compile it once. So the exactly the same yeah. bytecode oh. runs in both modes, and we just configure it from outside. So this is actually the cool story. Um, yeah, yeah. Because how it works, if you are curious, um, if you are running, for instance, Quarkus, or uh, you could do it with Hadidon, but they didn't deliver it yet. Uh, Micronaut can do it as well. Is um, mm-hmm. if you're running in serverless cloud, you know Jaxorize, right? Because you are Glassfish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the no. <clears throat> the uh, the cloud will send you HTTP JSON events, and Quarkus will parse these events and invoke your regular JAXORS endpoint. So you don't even notice that you are called by run- Lambda. So you don't need any proprietary, you know, AWS uh, uh, APIs. You just run your old Java e application as Lambda. And if you launch the Quarkus mm-hmm. uh, in on 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 EC2 machine, then you launch your EC2 machine, and if the machine has multi, um, several threads, then it will run concurrently, right? So uh, th- that's the basic yeah. idea. So there is no difference. No. Yeah. So selling it works already exactly. that way, and this makes me also excited because mm-hmm. we have, you know, we can start with the easy way, no infrastructure, and then on demand provision machines to save money, and this is a great option. And by the way, the third option in between, you can run the same in a Docker, for instance, on ECS or whatever, and yeah. But last, so this was just you now feedback to you. Why? Why is maybe the mm-hmm. most important feature? I wouldn't see say for me the most exciting because as a developer you don't see this very often. You know, this is the maybe the most boring feature and most important at the same time, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, the the uh, task scopes are interesting because this will impact my project actually because uh, a lots of clients are using uh, Thread Local. Mostly for fun. Yeah. Sometimes you know uh, they they have a need, <laughs> but usually they they just use it because they saw it somewhere. And the uh, the thread local is problematic with virtual threads, right? It, it really depends on what you want to do. Uh, first of all, thread locals are supported by virtual threads. Mm-hmm. So if you have an application that is using thread locals, not only for fun but for business, yeah. <laughs> 
sometimes you remove the thread local and, and the application is still running. We all know that in these old applications, you have so much dead code. Exactly. That sometimes you remove This is, by, by the way, this is my magic. Now you come in the project, I delete whatever <laughs> I don't understand. And, and then, then the feedbacks, you are genius. Only with, with you know, long experience. It's like, yeah, uh, the, the truth is I couldn't understand what you are doing. So delete it. It's still working. Uh, I'm done, right? So this is, <laughs> this is my secret. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah. So thread locals are supported by virtual threads. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, now the fact is you can do much better. Uh, th- thread locals is actually you, you need to have a little background in java to, to understand that but thread local were created in uh, 1998 i think java 2 and the java util concurrent api was created uh, 6 years later after that so thread locals are were made for basic threads and then java util concurrent came up with uh, executor services and stuff and people use them in executor services and this is kind of dangerous because what is a thread local? Thread local is a variable that shares the life cycle of your thread. Now, an executor service in a typical Java EE, Jakarta EE application is something you start up with your application that dies with your application. So all the threads in your executor service are actually sharing the life cycle of your application. That was not the case when thread local were introduced. Okay. You would create threads on demand, and that was kind of okay because threads were expensive, but everything was expensive, so it's not more expensive than any other, any other thing. So now you have thread local variables, and if you're not careful, they will actually share the life cycle of your application, not the life cycle of your thread. That is, in, in a model where you have one request, one thread, share the life cycle of your request. So if you don't call remove on your thread local variable, if you handle your thread local variable yourself, and you don't know that there is a remove method on them, so ask yourself, do I know that there is a remove method on my thread local? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if the answer is no, then you're in trouble. <laughs> because it means that if your thread is, is used to handle a first request and you put some kind of security secrets, secrets or whatever in the thread local variable of this thread and you don't remove them and then this thread is reused for another request that has nothing to do with the first one, then this second request will may actually have access to the security secrets Mm -hmm. you put in these thread local variables. Mm -hmm. So it could be, it can be actually a security issue in your application if you're not careful. Okay. There is a big issue. The idea... There is a big issue with that. Yeah. So with the security issue, I don't, uh, I never, maybe we didn't notice, no, the security issues, but there's another one. On application Mm -hmm. servers, so the issue is uh, the executor service, whatever, usually pulls the thread behind the scenes. If it pulls, you know, per thread, the the, uh, thread local is attached to -to one-to-one relation and it will remain as long the thread is alive, which means is we, um, or we, uh, the projects I tried to fix, introduce memo leaks. Because if you don't mm-hmm. call uh, remove, uh, the the the, uh, the the objects are gathered in the in the um, thread local, and the application crashes. Yeah. And in one project, this was crazy. Uh, what was <clears> gathered <throat> were transaction IDs or something. It was a very small project, so it means the project ran successfully for two weeks, and then it accumulated mm-hmm. memory and then died. It was really hard to fix because there are small projects. So you know. If you perform some stress tests and you had did the snapshot and you compared both snapshots, it was not obvious that there is a real pro- a problem there. And uh, th- therefore, yeah. I'm removing the thread local after the request is crucial for security and and especially for stability. So I always, if I see thread local, the chance is really high that the project has stability issues if there is no remove. Yeah, or absolutely. actually always you have you have this bug. If you don't don't call remove, it is a bug, and th- then yeah, therefore. The, the thread uh, yeah. the thread locals are usually always used in kind of an aspect oriented programming framework like you know interceptors or whatever mm. or decorators to decorate the method and after the method yeah, called the remove right so you need to be careful with that so there is a new uh, model to replace thread locals mm-hmm. which are is called scope values and that's the third thing de- uh, delivered by uh, by the loom project mm-hmm. uh, that works kind of the same. It, it works, I'd say, kind of the same because it's it's not exactly the same. The, the biggest difference and the most obvious difference is that thread local are mutable variables. Mm-hmm. So a thread can mutate them and then everybody will see that. Uh, whereas scope values are unmodifiable variables. Mm-hmm. Once you've set a value for a scope value object, you, you cannot change it. Yeah. Okay, you can't, can't do that. Now, you, you need to understand that the principles behind 
the Loom project and structured concurrency is that you want to avoid having loose threads at all costs. If you're using a structured task scope and completely, and if you avoid using executive services, your structured task scope is an object you create when you want to do some kind of asynchronous request. Mm -hmm. You launch your request, you close your structured task scope, you get the result and you, call, you, you close your structured task scope. So once you return with your result, the scope object was closed and all the threads, if you had loose threads at this point, all the threads were interrupted, garbage, there's nothing more. So no loose threads, nothing is actually escaping. So suppose you're, you have a method and this method is creating a structured task scope. When you exit this method, there's nothing, nothing is leaking outside of this method. No virtual thread uh, has been left behind when you exit that method. Okay, so the scope of the method is really the scope in which uh, all your thread, all your virtual threads have been created and then interrupted, erased, garbage, etc. Why no, it's so no, important? No, Let's say there's, there, there is one thread left. So what's the problem? Because after the method is garbage collected, maybe. So, but what, why you say this is that important? It's may because of stability. It's or, it's, it's important or? because it could be a memory leak. In okay. application, yeah. this is exactly what you described. Yeah, okay. Local. This is stability. what, you, what mm -hmm. you describe is a memory leak, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it could be a memory leak. Plus, you have a thread that is doing something, that is waiting something. Yeah. That it, you don't mm -hmm. know what it's doing. Yeah. And it's never a good idea to have. So, so what, what you meant is elements in an application that, that no that thread know should escape doing. the structured task yeah. scope, right? So they, they should be exactly. jailed there. And if the, if you destroy the, uh, the, the the scope, all threads has to be gone. This. You, Right. Yeah, this is okay. how yeah, this, this is this is how scope objects are, are working, and now you need to find the the idea is to 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 have the same kind of model for your scope values as this one. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have you don't want to have loose scope values. Yes. Okay. You can have yeah. loose virtual threads because they are bound to a thread that are bound to your application, and mm -hmm. this is you describe your memory leak issues, and I showed you security issues. So yeah. These are big issues in an application. Mm -hmm. So the model for scope values is actually the same as the model for virtual threads. You mm -hmm. don't want to have any loose scope values and you don't want to take the risk of having your, your users to call close or remove or whatever. You want that to be handled by the API itself. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you define, you, you create a scope value object and you are going to bind the value to this scope uh, value uh, variable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this binding of your variable and your value is valid within the context of a method call. Mm -hmm. And this method is modeled either by a runnable or a callable. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's the idea. All the rest is API details and you will check the documentation and then you will understand very easily because it's an easy API to handle. So within the context of this method call, let's say it's a runnable, this binding is accessible and is valid. And when you exit this method, then the binding is gone. You mm -hmm. cannot have access to the binding you define. Can it be with, only with the runnable device. or callable, or ca you can use other methods? I think methods it's only runnable possible. and callable, and it's still a preview feature, so it may change in the future. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what <coughs> it, it means is right now you have, uh, let's say, runnable run. So if you are in the method, yeah. you have access to the callable. After the methods, there is no more access, yeah, right? Exactly. This is what they are saying. Exactly. exactly. And if you if you... If you uh, launch this runnable several times with different bindings, each method call will see its own binding mm -hmm. because actually it's stored in the stack, so we can't, so, can't be messed up. For me now and my Java is, E and MicroProfile friends, is very similar to request scoped, right? So if you have the yeah, exactly, this is the request scoped, exactly. and a request scoped should actually replace thread local, but it didn't because uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know why. But uh, request scoped is actually the answer for for thread local and application servers. And now we have an, a Java SE answer. If you are not running application servers, it would be the um, task scoped, right? Task scoped. No, uh, uh, scoped value. Scope scope value. value. Scope value. Scope exactly. value. Exactly. Mm -hmm. but, but you're not done because your runnable could be itself launching threads, either mm -hmm. in the old fashioned way, and mm -hmm. it could be a platform thread or a virtual thread. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it could be creating executor services, which is the same as creating thread. And it could be creating such a task scope. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's creating threads, okay, good old threads or virtual threads in, in, the, in the old way with new threads or the factory methods or the executor service, then this thread can escape your method call. 
it can live mm -hmm. longer yes. than your method code. Yeah. Your method can return, but your thread is still active. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is escaping the scope of this method. Mm -hmm. So in that case, because it's escaping, the scope values, the binding of your scope value variable will not be transmitted to the code executed within these threads. Mm -hmm. Because it's escaping and you don't want to have this kind of mm -hmm. escaped value. Okay? okay. If you do that, then you will have to call remove at some point and you don't want that. Mm -hmm. So if you if you if your runnable is creating a thread in the old fashioned way, this the code executed in that thread will, will not see the binding of this uh, scope value variables yes. to set up. But if you call and this is why it's a little complex to understand. If you if you uh, if you launch a structured task scope that mm -hmm. itself is launching virtual thread, mm -hmm. but in a in a confined way, that is, after your method call is is done, when you return from that method, you know that this scope value object will have been closed and all the thread will be garbage, etc. Then you're losing your your sorry, you're creating virtual threads in a controlled way and in a way that is bound by still bound by the the scope of the calling of the first method you, mm -hmm. you called uh, of your runnable. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the virtual threads and the code executed in these virtual threads within this structure task scope will see the binding you set up for your scope value variable. This is great. I don't know if I'm uh, uh, if I'm clear here, but so it, it there is really no way this binding can escape this method. It can be transmitted to other threads as long as the life cycle of these threads is bound to the scope of the method you're calling. And this is the case only if you're using structured task scope. Yeah, uh, uh, let me rephrase. So structured task scope for me is a root. If you start uh, starting with a structured task scope and a virtual thread is started, and this virtual thread yeah. starts another virtual thread and run runnable um, works behind the scenes, only then mm -hmm. the task uh, scope values are passed between the father and the in the in the, in the in the children, right? Only in this case, because exactly. task scope is uh, is like the wrapper around. And yeah, exactly. I give you this is a perfect feature. I give you a, an example for application servers. What you are explaining on Java SE is, is the same problem happens on application servers in two different ways. First, you have we have one request scoped with values. And this request scope starts another asynchronous process, which is very common, but this request mm -hmm. scope gets lost. Of course, this is normally yeah. the same request. So either you have to reopen your own request scope and pass it, or the data gets mm -hmm. lost. And basic, and this is actually what uh, also um, on, 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 you know, on Quarkus and similar frameworks, this is a common asked question, you know, why I don't see the scopes again, because you started another transaction or another process and the other process can can run longer than the first one. So this is, you know, you have yep. like a facade on it, uh, and it c calls a method, and this inner method can run longer than the outer ones, and this way I get lost. Another Absolutely. analogy is transactions. You cannot have nested transactions for the same reason. So if you uh, if you start, you know, uh, the first transaction, and uh, and you have a nested transaction. And the nested transaction is requires new again. So there are two transactions; they are basically independent. So you cannot just say, you know, if the inner one uh, is, roll, uh, is rolled back, the outer one is also rolled back because they're two independent transactions and uh, they can be asynchronous. Um, but yeah. with what what could happen is very easily now, if the application servers are running virtual, uh, 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 using virtual threads behind the scenes, now we can have asynchronous processes with request code. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's indeed. almost nothing you, to do you, for you, them. You will, ha you will have to, you, you will have to set up your, you will have to run all your virtual threads within structured task scope objects. Yeah, but, but this is I, easily I see, doable I, I because don't see if, how if you, can, yeah, it's doable absolutely. It's doable. Because if you think our eye detection application servers, like at the boundaries first, like mm -hmm. a facet, and this facet, you know, starts uh, transactions, but it usually waits until they complete. This is this is the common process. You have use cases like you know flight booking and hotel booking or whatever booking. They can be asynchronous, yeah. but usually are waiting for completion. And I would say I'm really excited, excited because yeah. this will make you know things easily possible, which are hardly yeah. possible right and now. And it's uh, it, it's also a very safe way of doing things because it's mm -hmm. handled by the API. It's not mm -hmm. handled by your code. Mm -hmm. I mean, could be handled by the framework, which is also a safe way of doing things from a from a 
uh, developer perspective, everything that is handled by your framework or by your by the JDK itself or by your API is always safer than the, the, the thing you need to handle yourself. And because it's enforced at the API level, makes it much, much uh, safer for you to use. Once you're done with your with your method call, everything is cleaned up. No more memory leak. No more security information leak. No nothing. It's it's much 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 better. Much. Better What's cool about uh, Java in general? Is, um, Java at the beginning was not that capable. So what I say, okay, if Java cannot do this, so I you know focus on J two E and Java. E. There were lots of you know we had um, the the uh, JaxRS client was there. Now we get the MicroProfile yeah. web client and the request scope we 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 covered right now. And what I observe over time, I'm actually removing my enterprise stuff and replacing with plain Java, right? So, for instance, for simple stuff, I just use HTTP 11 clients, you know, those you introduce. I don't need a micro profile, no Jakarta stuff. I just use HTTP 11 client. And uh, yeah. we are actually pretty far. So today is too late and this is not released, but we get string templates, right? So it makes me really excited, uh, excited because the string templates can be not only used as a SQL statement, for instance, could be really cool to use them, or you could use it as a replacement for Java server pages, actually, right? And if you combine string templates with uh, virtual threads, which we get more or less request scoped, I'm, I'm only waiting to have a very lightweight, almost not existing, you know, an application server just based on Java, nothing else, you know, no application servers, just plain old Java, which runs your stuff. This Actually, is very very possible if you if you if you look and this is what Helidon tries to do. They also have a Java SE edition, which is lighter weight. Yeah. But what makes me uh, really, really what, what I really like is about the idea to removing you know uh, I don't know call it bloated Java E is not bloated to me, but you know unnecessary ballast from Java E and MicroProfile and replacing with standard Java, which which seems more and more viable. And if we are not using doing this as Java developers, the platform developers can do this, which is uh, very good. Mm -hmm. So today, we only managed to discuss one feature. I don't like to start with the second one because it would take two hours. You are way too interesting and way too knowledgeable. <laughs> so I, I use you, you know, also to learn new things. But um, where people can find you on the internet, you know, uh, we have the, uh, I call it coffee cast, but you no, know, just point to your resources and your personal stuff as well. The... So, um, uh, you know, I work as a, in a Java developer advocate team at, uh, at Oracle in the Java mm -hmm. platform group. So if you just connect to youtube.com slash Java, mm -hmm. you will find all the content that, uh, that I, I produce uh, and uh, all the other members of the teams are, are producing. So yes, you'll find the Jeb Cafe series. You'll find the uh, Nikolai's Parlogs uh, Inside Java Newscast series. You will find uh, the content produced by... Um, Billy Corando also he produces short videos of a few minutes focusing on a particular feature of of the Java language. You will find uh, if you if you're really interested in the in twenty one, <laughs> I guess you are. <laughs> uh, you may find interesting to follow a series we published back in September uh, just for the release of twenty one, mm -hmm. uh, which was called Road to Twenty One, and that, that's a series of several videos. There are also videos on security by uh, Anna Maria, which are really great. Uh, and, and so you can you can connect and, and, and have all these these videos. And we I also publish a, a series of shorts, and I really like it because it's very funny to to make that uh, called the cracking the Java coding interview. And in mm -hmm. just one minute, you take take a question and you try to find some uh, uh, clever things to say about. And Nicola is also there. Funny uh, fun uh, uh, Nicola Palog, right? It's also on the, yeah. on, the, on the team. They're the only lazy member of a team which doesn't produce any, any anything anymore. Uh, he produced the the podcast. I think his name is not Daniel. Oh, right? the the the, the, the podcast. There was some kind of a pause in a in a podcast in the Inside Java podcast. Uh, David Delabasse. Uh, David Delabas. Uh, uh, not Daniel. Yeah, David. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Apologize. I also had other podcasts. David. This is the only lazy uh, <coughs> chef, the manager, right? We manage <laughs> the all. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe maybe he's working on other stuff. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> you don't see. I wouldn't really call him lazy. I don't think that's the right. <laughs> he will like it. To he will like what it. He's doing. <laughs> <laughs> he will will like it. He knows how it's meant. Really nice guy. Uh, I guess. Okay. I'm sure. I'm sure he will love it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, we we, ju we just published uh, an inside Java newscast uh, a few days ago, by the way, uh, on uh, the Foreign Memory API, which was really interesting. And Panama, if you're yeah. in a podcast, there's a about on the very topic of autumn threads and Elidon, there is an interview with uh, Thomas. Uh, sorry, 
Lange. Thomas Lange, yes, the, the mm -hmm. main alien, uh, I, I think he's leading the, the, the alien yeah. project, where he explains actually how he factored the, 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 the core engine of uh, the Elidon uh, server mm -hmm. uh, to VertoSwed. And it's really yeah. interesting. It was published about a year ago, I think, something like that. Maybe and on YouTube, what I like, you know, the entire uh, stuff you are producing is also fun. Uh, this is a high high production value. So, the, you know, the Java 21 mm -hmm. road is like, like a map, you know, so it's a nice. Yeah. And uh, so it is. It's also fun. It's not not only you know uh, dry theory is fun. So thank you. Yeah. And I, I have to invite you, to you back to talk about your second favorite oh. feature. And we have lots of features. <laughs> so this is a never ending story right now. I think <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Perfect. I'm very happy to do that. <laughs> thank you. Thank so you. Much, Adam.